right, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is JC. I moved here uh, in January, so I'm still getting to know everybody. Um, really quick, I just need to pray to get started um, before we start. Dear God, thank you so much for getting to be here. Um, I pray that you take away the nervousness and the, just the nerves of being up here. I pray that you put it on my heart what you want said and take away what you don't. Um, but I pray that you provide for your people what you want them to take away. I love you and thank you in Jesus' name, amen. amen. All righty. So I'm a try. So um, we're looking through Nehemiah and last week, um, just to summarize, we were talking through that the wall was built. So we've covered Nehemiah one through six. We're talking about seven today. Um, a couple disclaimers. One. I'm going to say the word promise way too much today. Um, just because there's no synonyms and you're gonna say it a lot. Um, also, we're gonna skip 67 verses um, because, and I'll tell you why. But if you have a Bible, go over to Nehemiah chapter seven and we're gonna start in verse one. In Nehemiah chapter 7, verse 1 through 6, it says, After the wall had been rebuilt and I had set the doors in place, the gatekeepers and musicians and Levites were all appointed. I put in charge of Jerusalem my brother Hanani, and along with Hanani, the commander of the citadel, because he was a man of integrity and feared God more than most people do. I said to them, The gates of Jerusalem are not to be opened until the sun is hot. While the gatekeepers are still on duty, have them shut the doors and bar them. Also, appoint residents of Jerusalem as guards, some, of, some at their posts and some near their houses. Now, the city was large and spacious, but there were few people in it, and the houses had not been rebuilt. So my God put it on, into my heart to assemble the nobles, the officials, and the common people for registration by families. I found the genealogical record of those who had been the first to return. This is what I found written written there, these are the people of the province who came up from captivity of the exiles whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had taken captive. And so they returned from, to Jerusalem, each to his own town. Um, the next 67 verses list out 42,000 people and families. <laughs> so we're not talking through all of that. And if you jump down to verse 73, it says, yeah, no problem. <laughs> I was like, why aren't we talking about the meat? And it was like, if you can, by all means, have at it later. Uh, but in verse 73, it says, So the priests, the Levites, gatekeepers, and singers, some of the people, and the temple servants, and all Israel lived in their towns. And when the seventh month had come, the people of Israel were in their towns. And Ezra is written just around the same time, which is another book. Um, in chapter 3, 1, you don't have to go there, but it says, When the seventh month came, the children of Israel were in the towns, and he adds a detail. He says, the people were gathered as one man to Jerusalem. So take a second, and I want you to imagine what it would have been like um, if you were a kid or a young adult, and you saw Jerusalem get burned. Um, and so we know that there were people old enough because next week they talked through, some people actually cried when the foundation of the temple was set because they remembered what it was like. So there are people who were there when it was originally burned down by Nebuchadnezzar about 70 years prior. So think through, you're a kid or a young adult and you are being taken captive away from where you grew up, the places that you played as a kid, where you hung out as a young adult, where you may have worked, all of that is now leveled. Like you can't recognize what's what, where's where, because it's all just flat and it's charred from fire. And so you're taken captive to this new area. Um, this kingdom was able to conquer many different countries. So you're not just the only country in captivity. There are others. And I have to wonder how easy or natural it may have been to, when you're in there or like in another area and there are people from other countries just to assimilate and be like, I used to be a part of God's people, but we lost. I was like, uh, yeah, we had a lot of promises, but I'm here with everyone else now. Um, maybe it, they may have felt we abandoned God and this is what comes. Like we left and this is the result. Maybe some may have felt that, man, God abandoned us. 
Um, there may have been a lot of feelings just from being captive. Now, 70 years later, the wall is finished. So 52 days, they managed to rebuild the wall. Pretty miraculous. Like 70 years, nobody even tried. And then all of a sudden, this 52-day gap, wall's built. And it's a big, thick wall. Like Kurt was talking, it's, like, it's a, at least around nine feet thick. So it took time and energy. And um, sorry, a Marvel reference, just because it's not really a sermon if you don't reference Marvel. Um, <laughs> but there's a scene where there's an archer who something very big happens, and he loses his entire family. All his kids, wife, gone. Like they're, it was two years ago. <laughs> But he loses his entire family, and he goes, he goes on this justice kind of killing spree where he starts taking out all these gangs. And a friend finds him and says, we may have found a way to bring your family back. And he says, and the scene's happening in the rain because you can't see, you can't tell if he's crying. But he says, don't give me hope. I don't, I don't know if I can handle believing that. And so there are a lot of people who may have felt that of, don't give me hope. It's been, I've spent 70 years of my life in Babylon, and you're telling me I might be able to go back, the walls rebuilt? And there may have been a lot of feelings, but Nehemiah was a different story. So recapping, in chapter one, all of this started because Nehemiah focused on a promise. Also, thank you so much. Can you go to the next slide, please? The title is, See the Promise, Live the Promise. Because it all started with a promise. I gave you a disclaimer. I'm going to say promise a lot. But it all started when Nehemiah, so he hears about what the condition of the people and the condition of the wall. He cries, he prays, and he fasts. And when he prays in the middle of it, he tells God, remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, if you're unfaithful, I'll, I'll scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as my dwelling for my name. And that's in Nehemiah 1, verses 8 through 9. But that's before Nehemiah takes the step to talk to the king, who's his boss, who basically gives him the resources to go and build the wall. So before he even goes, he's praying to God saying, hey, you promised this, and I'm, I'm stepping out. Help me talk to the king. Now, whether you've been here the last couple weeks or not, they have gone through, so while they're building the wall, lots of enemies, death threats, actual plans to kill them, deception trying to trap Nehemiah or the Israelites into an agreement to pull them away to kill them, um, the ev environmental hazards of, while they're building the wall, they are threatened to the point where they have to hold a sword in one hand and try and build the wall with the other. And so they have, they have such security measures that they're trying to take care of themselves, but trying to build a wall is not easy, particularly if that's just what you're focused on, not protecting the person next to you. And so Nehemiah's gotta organize and lead all of this effort, but what he, takes him through it is, hey God, you promised this, and I'm sticking with this until. Now, I wanna ask, what would've, if you were working on the wall, what would have been communicated if Nehemiah left right after the wall was finished? If the wall gets finished and Nehemiah just leaves, like, all right, I did my job, I did my part, that's it. I don't think anybody would expect much more from me because I, I planned, I cried, like, I put my heart into this. But if he left, that tells the people that it was about the wall, not the promise. And so, in reality, it's about the promise not a wall. And so we focus a lot about the wall because it's a pretty monumental feat to be able to build a wall in 52 days like that while being threatened. But the idea was that it wasn't about getting a job done. God's promises were not about getting something done, but about him and his people. And that's the thing I really want to nail home is God promises a lot of things, but it's always about you. Let me just get my space, really, my spot. And Nehemiah says something pretty incredible. So at tw after he takes all of those measures, he doesn't just leave. He says, God put it in my heart to assemble everybody. So he goes and registers everyone, which is, when you stop and think, it's kind of 
that's overwhelming to me. Because if I do something exhausting, like I pour myself out, I give everything I've got, personally, something that I have to work out of is I've developed a thing where I, have to, I get to do what I want before I go and give more. Or if I do, if I do a lot of stuff and I'm, done, I'm dead, tired, I want to do something that I want to do, which I feel like is natural. But they had just spent 52 days, and Nehemiah says, hey, God put it on my heart. I got to count everybody. I got to see what, what the state of the people. Um, and he doesn't stop at a task. Can you go to the next slide, please? So the first point is it's not about the wall. It's about the promise. And just to compare, I don't know how well this pops up. Sorry, I don't mean for death by PowerPoint. But I wanted to contrast the difference between a task and walking with God because there's a big difference that I'll talk about in a second. Tasks, um, the focus of it is the task itself, just to avoid consequences, maybe about self. When you walk with God, the focus is God himself, the promises, or people. When it's hard for a task, a lot of us try just to avoid the hard part. Or we want to hurry up, get it done. Just get it done and over with, don't have to worry about it. Or maybe it's very anxiety inducing. Um, whereas walking with God, you get to pray, process it with God. You can process it with, process it with people. Um, when it's finished, or when you finish a task, move on, next, maybe relax. But, and this exposed my heart, you don't stop walking with God, which exposed something in me, because when I put that down, I, I wanted there to be an end. I was like, I want there to be, a, well, wait, does that mean I want walking with God to feel like a task? Um, but the why behind it m for tasks, they have to get done. Maybe the chant is, I need the money, that's why I'm here. Or I need the grade, that's why I'm here. But for God, there's a big difference between Nehemiah saying, I just want to get the wall done, and God put it on my heart, so I have to see how the people are. The reason I bring this up is, there are, this is not a good versus bad side. So we all have tasks. We all have things that we have to get done regardless of how we feel. Um, the danger is when doing, walking with God feels like a task. So when you do something with God, if you focus on a promise, if that feels heavy and burdensome, that's where we want to focus. Um, and I wanted to ask, have you ever done some spiritual activity but felt different different times you do it. So maybe it's reading your Bible, or it's talking to someone about God, or it could be anything spiritual. But it's funny how you may feel obligatory, or like this is just a duty that I have to do, versus this is effortless. This is really easy to do because I'm doing it for God. I've been there, for sure. Um, but I bring that up because promises make the difference between something being a task and something being I'm doing it with God. So promises help to adjust our sight and our hearts to, hey, I'm not doing this for me, I'm doing this for God. Um, and it becomes much less burdensome and heavy because now you're, we're doing it with God. Thank you. And so the wall, if we th it changes when we think that the wall happened to get built while they focused on God. It wasn't about the wall. God could have, like, God did it with Israelites who have the longest history of complaining. <laughs> like when you read the Bible in the desert, all they did was complain. And we can relate to that. We can look down, but we know that a lot of us, we, we're complainers as well. Um, but how did God change a portion of that nation to duck down 52 days, get a wall done, willing to die for each other with no complaints? It's like God can do a lot of stuff if we give him something to work with. And can you change this next slide, please? And so the second point is that God always keeps his promises. This is near and dear to my heart. Um, a quick scripture in Numbers 23 says that God is not a man, in verse 19, that he should lie, or a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not fulfill it? That's a big scripture because God is not a man. I struggle a great deal because I compare God to man a lot. I've had people promise something to me and then it doesn't happen. And that's a special kind of disappointment because if I'm really looking forward to something and 
Uh, it doesn't happen for whatever reason. It could be a great reason. I, I have to trash the trust or that hope. And I was like, okay, well, moving on. God is not like man. God is not someone who promises you something and then takes it back. He does not give you an excuse for not keeping a promise. He always comes through. Um, before they were taken into captivity, God actually promised them something. And we're going to read it in a second. And that's big because God could have... So just history. Israel goes to Egypt. They come out, spend 40 years in the desert because they were disobedient and they complained a lot. And then afterwards, they go, they settle in the kingdom, and, or they settle in the land, and they go through this period of judges. It's this whole cycle of, we want God, they get comfortable, they sin, God sends them someone to save them. It was this whole thing that they did for generations. After that, they have kings. Same cycle, same exact thing. Then eventually they get taken into a place called Assyria. So they're captive. They end up coming back out. Now they're in captivity again for the same reason. And so if God were a man, maybe he'd think, I'm not giving you a promise. I've, we've done this dance for too long. But he actually gives them a promise and says, hey, I'm going to take you out. Or not take you out. I'm going to bring you out of misspoke there. But I'm going to bring you out of the land that you're going to. And he gives them tons of hope. And so something to realize is that for all of us, promises give a lot of hope. Um, which we don't really think about when things are going well, but when we need it, hope makes a world of a difference. Um, and just to be vulnerable, um, actually let me ask you something before I do that. Um, if I were able to take all of God's promises away from you, like erase them from your memory, how much of your life would look different tomorrow? So would your motivation, like would your drive change? Would your direction change? Would you notice much of a difference or would you be halted because you rely on, so what that really asks is how much do we rely on the promises of God? And so if we took it out, if there's not much of a change, we've developed a way of life where we don't really need God's promises. Um, and just to share for myself, um, I really struggle accepting God's grace. We hear it a lot. I don't naturally like to accept it. Um, and it sounds really bad to say, but it's the truth. And I went after studying it a great deal a couple months ago because I boiled it down to... Um, I really struggle to accept or to hinge everything on something that I can't affect. So for everything to rely on one thing that I can't, I don't know how much there is. I can't turn it on. I can't turn it off. I don't know. I can't control it. And so what I did for most of my life is I ignore it and develop a way to live without it. I don't need it because I don't know what to do. I can't change it. And I don't want to rely on it if I can't change it. Um, and so what, I, what that did was I ended up missing out on a ton of promises that are incredible. Um, so that, that was probably one of the greatest studies I've done was realizing, because well, part of the reason we struggle with prom or I struggle with promises, I don't speak for we, is misconceptions about God influence how we see promises. So if we think that God is like a man, we're not gonna trust the promises because he's gonna leave us and do whatever people have done to us in the past. Um, this promise that God actually gives them in Jeremiah, so we're only gonna read half of it because Nehemiah 7 only talks about half of it. We're gonna talk about the second half next week. But in Jeremiah 32, it says, you are saying about this city, by the sword, famine, plague, it will be given into the hands of the king of Babylon. But this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, I will gather them from the lands where I banish them in my furious anger and great wrath. I will bring them back to this place and let them live in safety. That's the wall. They will be my people and I will be their God. I will give them singleness of heart and action. Think back to the person that maybe the, the older man or woman that you thought about initially that saw all of Jerusalem get burned, the walls down, everything's leveled. 
Imagine them coming back, they see not just the wall built, but they see everybody come back in unity of heart. Like everybody's on the same page. Maybe they went to Jerusalem and they were holding onto that promise for dear life. It's like God said that he's not gonna leave us, he's actually gonna bring us back. That was the one thing driving maybe that one person to hold on. And then they come back and they see that promise come true before their eyes. What do you think, like what would that yield in a person to see a promise of God come just like walk in front of you? You see 42, around 50,000 people walk in front of you. It's like this is exactly what God promised. So that, that's a big deal. Um, lots of tears I imagine because if you get used to a lifestyle in Babylon and you come back out, you realize God has not given up on us. What, and also sets a new uh, reference point for your faith. Because if God can do this, what else can he do? Um, and so I wanted to put out just a challenge for all of us, thinking about God's promises. Promises turn a lot of tasks that seem heavy into something very light. Um, there was an early Christian that says... <laughs> Sounds very morbid, but he, he pointed out that um, the mind doesn't see the ball of chain when it's in heaven. And so early Christians went through it, but when the mind is in heaven and when your heart is set on things above, things here don't seem as hard. Um, but a challenge, so areas of our hearts that um, we struggle with promises of God tend to be occupied by a lie. So, in trying to identify that, try to, instead of figuring out what promise don't I have a, what promise do I have a hard time with, try and find what lie do you see in your heart. And then from that, what has God put on your heart? So Nehemiah had, like, he was praying to God consistently and he knew, up, oh, God put this on my heart, I have to count the people. And so what has God put on your heart to do for your family, the kingdom, whatever it may be. What is it that, and it's not something general that he would give to everybody. Um, so what has he done for you? Like, what does he want you specifically to do? And then pray, ask God, and then talk to people and try and find a promise that addresses both of those things, if you can, one or both. So what promise is in the Bible for you? And that's something that you take ownership of because um, next week we talk through it wasn't just the wall, but building the temple, and then it's the whole other piece of, I will be their God, and they will be my people. So with that, I'm going to pray, and I believe the singers come up for one last song. Dear God, thank you so much for the opportunity to um, speak. I do pray that you help us to take away what you have in store for us, God, with your promises, God. Help us not to let it fall to the ground that you gave promises to Nehemiah and that he held on to that you gave to Moses but there are so much uh, there are so many other promises that are yes in Jesus for us um, help us to believe that but hold on to it and ask how high is high when we walk with you um, I love you and thank you in Jesus name amen <laughs>